It's Friday. Awesome. And we're glad you're wrapping up your week with CNN Student News. From the CNN Center, I'm Carl Azus. First up, crisis in America's economy as members of the House and Senate debate President Bush's bailout proposal. Yesterday, they said the negotiations were making progress. But as of Thursday evening, some lawmakers said they are still nowhere near a deal. President Bush invited leaders from both parties to the White House yesterday, along with presidential candidates Barack Obama and John McCain. Mr. Bush said the meeting was an attempt to move the process forward, but it ended without a deal in place. Meanwhile, protesters voiced their anger over the bailout proposal. Activist groups said that hundreds of demonstrations took place across the country yesterday. Okay, that's where things stand now. How in the world did we get here? Earlier today, I talked with Paul LaMonica, editor-at-large at CNNMoney.com, about what led to this current financial crisis and how we arrived at this proposal for a $700 billion solution. Paul, the economy, what is going on with it? Really simply put, what's happened is that since housing prices have fallen of dramatically as they have in the past uh, you know, year or so, and a lot of people are not able to afford their mortgages anymore because they probably weren't, they were given loans that they probably shouldn't have received from banks. A lot of banks gave out loans to people who may not have qualified for loans in the past. And because so many mortgages have gone sour and people are defaulting, foreclosures have gone up, that's really hurt a lot of the nation's banks, investment banks, and even some insurance companies because many of them just had big investments in these pools of, of loans that have gone bad. Bailout. We've heard the figure $700 billion. How did they get at that number? I think it is, in some respects, a very rough estimate of how many... Uh, uh, you know how much the cost would be to purchase the worst performing uh, loans that many banks are stuck with right now. A lot of people think that the number could go higher than that if the government is not able to sell these loans for a decent price. And on the flip side, some people think that the cost could be much lower because the government may actually be able to get a better price through an orderly sale process as opposed to something that's rushed and it won't cost taxpayers as much. So that $700 billion number is really just a benchmark right now. I, I doubt it'll cost that exact number. It could be a lot higher, it could be a lot lower. Today's shout out goes out to Mr. Hubbard's government classes at Franklin County High School in Rocky Mountain, Virginia. Which of these cities is not scheduled to host a presidential debate? You know what to do, is it? Oxford, Mississippi, Nashville, Tennessee, Hempstead, New York, or Boston, Massachusetts. You've got three seconds. Go. Boston is the odd man out. No debate about it. That's your answer, and that's your shout out. Oxford was scheduled to host the first presidential debate tonight about foreign policy. But when we taped this program, things were still a little up in the air. See, when Senator McCain suspended his campaign Wednesday, he said he wouldn't take part in the debate if Congress hadn't reached a deal on the bailout. Now, at some point, the presidential candidates will face off, and when they do, Carol Costello tells us what we might expect to see. As debaters, both men have certainly had a lot of practice. During the primary, McCain logged 14, Obama 22. Still, this series of three debates will be different. One major gaffe could be fatal. The race has been that close, and both men have shown they can slip up. When Barack Obama uttered this line while debating Hillary Clinton, You're likable no. enough. Thank Hillary, you, sir. <laughs> he gave credence to those who feel he's condescending. A to find out. And his sometimes long-winded professorial answers don't help either. It seems a little absurd that we don't want our candidates to sound too smart, but sometimes we don't want them to sound too smart and too long-winded. We actually want to like have a sort of an emotional connection with them. Should look care very carefully at Some analysts say McCain has the opposite problem. He is sometimes slow to answer questions which make him appear uncertain. In May of last year when McCain was asked whether he believed in evolution, yes. Is I'm curious is there anybody on the stage that does not agree in a, believe in evolution? Yeah. May I may I just add to that? Sure. I, I believe in evolution, but I also believe when I hike the Grand Canyon and see it at sunset that the hand of God is there also. The big plus for McCain in debate, McCain's passion. 
foreign policy. On the subject of Osama bin Laden, he is responsible for the deaths of thousands of innocent Americans. He is now orchestrating other attacks on the United States of America. McCain views the world through sort of like right or wrong and honor or dishonor. And he is sort of at his best, and I think he's at his most authentic when he's talking in those visceral terms. And while humor won't exactly fit into the debate during these troubled times, Obama is clearly capable of connecting in a warm, humorous way. Listen to how he responded to a question well. about Bill Clinton being the first black president. I would have to, you know, investigate more, you know, uh, Bill's dancing abilities and, <laughs> you know. Uh... To get the latest on the scheduled debate, head to CNN.com. And when the presidential candidates do face off, our viewing guide will help you interpret the event. You can find that free resource at CNNStudentNews.com. Roberto Clemente Walker was born in Carolina, Puerto Rico in 1934. He made his debut as Major League Baseball player in 1955, becoming one of the first Latin American baseball stars in the U.S. Throughout his 18-year career, Clemente helped lead the Pittsburgh Pirates to two World Series championships, recorded his 3,000 base hit, won four National League batting titles, and earned the Most Valuable Player honor in 1966. Clemente was the first Hispanic inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in 1973. His accomplishments were also recognized off the field, like his humanitarian work after a massive earthquake hit Nicaragua in 1972. He died that year in a plane crash while attempting to deliver aid to Nicaraguan victims. Celebrating the life and achievements of Roberto Clemente, this is Spanish Heritage Month. Lots of good comments on our blog to tell you about today. On yesterday's report about a district going to a four-day school week to save gas money, Russell wrote, After three days off, I would definitely start to get lazy and senioritis would be more contagious. But a class from Randolph, Nebraska has been on the four-day school week for three years. They love it, saying you get into the routine of longer days and they aren't bad at all. On the topic of classes separated by gender, Ross wrote, it may supposedly help students learn better, but who would want a room full of guys and no girls? I feel your pain. But Laura thinks splitting up guys and girls is a good idea because girls like to take time at some things, whereas guys like to speed through their work. And Ashley liked the idea too because she says there will be no boys to get class off track. Ashley, I respectfully disagree. A little distraction can be a lot of fun. And finally today, a four-legged friend who uses formulas to help him fetch. Now, calculus, nasty, can be a very tough subject for anyone to master, but Tim Penning says it comes naturally to Elvis, which is a little surprising considering Elvis is a dog. Bill Osmolsky of affiliate WKOW in Madison, Wisconsin, introduces us to this calculating canine. Elvis's priorities are clear. He has to find the uh, minimum amount of time it takes him to get to the ball. On the beach, Dr. Pennings would throw the ball into the lake. He then watched how far Elvis would run along the shore before deciding to swim for it. And when he did that, it reminded me of um, problems that I would always do in calculus where I had a similar situation and when I found the solution, it was exactly the same path that he took. Leave it to a college professor to ruin a perfectly good game of fetch with something like calculus. Still, Dr. Pennings was convinced he was on to something. He started taking measurements and making calculations based on Elvis' path. When I realized how close he was coming to the optimal solution, that was quite a surprise. I wasn't expecting it to be so good. Apparently no one else was either. That discovery made the name Elvis famous. Again, you can find this Elvis in newspapers, magazines, and academic journals around the world. He's a great ambassador for mathematics, and that's why it's fun to do it. This sometimes seems like a boring subject, but uh, when you have a dog like Elvis, it can really kind of bring some, some light to it. And Laura, unsuspecting children and college students alike. I'm going to have to go and, and actually do my calculus now. And Elvis proves calculus isn't always about numbers on a board. Well, obviously he's not doing the calculus in his head. He just has some sort of an innate ability to find the optimal solution. No matter how he does it, Elvis brings hope for many calculus students. If the, the little guy can do it, I can probably get through it. That mathematic mud is the final factor in today's equation. We'll formulate a new show for you on Monday. Have a great weekend.